Uh, let me recap real quickly where we are in this lecture. So we have guests, so just as a heads up, right in the middle of the lecture. So I'm going to continue, but let me just write down what we know so far. So we haven't gotten too far into this. Um, so real quickly from last time. We're studying mixture models, so additive mixture models. And in particular, we're studying Gaussian additive mixture models that are rather flexible. They're probably a go-to choice. I will mention, just as a heads up, there's something I always do with mixture models and Dirichlet processes, which are a type of mixture model, is I always add a Cauchy component to the end. And what that always does for me, I always have this thing with some probability, this Cauchy component, and what it always does is it makes my analysis robust to outliers. So I always have this other component that if I have a singleton observation and I'm trying to cram it into one of the mixtures, so let's say I pick K is equal to Q, the number of mixture components, and then there's an outlier somewhere. It's going to get thrown into one of those components. So what I want to do is make sure that it never gets thrown into that component and I always add this Cauchy component so that it don't catch everything. So it has heavy enough tails, that compared to the normal mixture components, um, it would have more weight of being in the Cauchy component because the tails are so fat. So that's something I like to do. I call it the Cauchy net. So it's not a very clever idea, but you can prove a lot of stuff showing that your rates of convergence, your robustness of the analysis is better, and it's easy to do, and it seems to always work. So I've got a lot of literature where I've done things like that. Um, and so, just keep that in mind. I'm not going to do that here. I'm just going to assume that everything came from some normal mixture model. I have control over the model, so I get to say how everything is distributed. In real life, I don't get to do that. I get a data set that wasn't generated from my model, but approximately it is. So if I'm collecting large amounts of data online, and I'm doing like some web screen, and the fields got filled in by some automation process, so let's say Zillow or Trulia, and I'm looking at house prices, and I'm trying to cluster like groups with each other, um, there's messes all over the place. You'll see houses that cost $300,000 next to houses that cost $10 billion. And so a $10 billion house has a 1 billion square foot plan, and I happen to know that doesn't exist. So somebody messed up the decimal place. Uh, so just keep in mind this stuff is really flexible, but we'll just study the Gaussian mixture model. So an additive mixture model looks like this. It looks like Xi's are going to be coming from this thing. I'll, run, I'll use the same notation. K goes from 1 to cap K. That's the number of mixture components. You might think of those as clusters or groups. So this is going to be pi K. This is going to be the probability of being in group K. times whatever the mixture components model is. So I'm just going to write this down as fx, given whatever my model parameters are. But fx to me, given the model parameters, this is going to be equal to um, 1 over root 2 pi square root sigma k. So that's going to be the components variance or standard deviation. e to the minus 1 half x minus mu k, the components mean, squared divided by sigma k squared. So you can change the functional form of these. So a lot of times I'll do something with uh, some finite component of mixture components, and then I'll add one more Cauchy. Um, the name of the game is to figure out what is the pi in front of it. So there's a little bit of work that you have to do is how do you calibrate the model, how many errors do you expect to see in the data set. So nobody can ever tell you that up front, so you have to do some sort of empirical estimation. Um, 
So this is what we're studying right here. And the name of the game for this whole thing is to figure out all the mu's. What are these things? What are the sigmas? And then also what are the associated group probabilities? So that's the, what we're trying to solve. Um, I wrote this down a little bit differently last time that I ended up saying there's a latent variable that describes which group I'm in. So I'm going to say z is equal to k right here. And for every xi, there's an associated z. So I'm just going to write that down right here. zi is equal to k. And then I could kind of either interchange. I could say that zi is equal to k. So it's the exact same thing. And I've got the zi here. And the reason I'm going to do that is because I wanted to note that I've got this latent parameter that you don't get to see in everything denoting which group you belong to. So for a two-component mixture model, k is equal to 2, what we're talking about is sampling from, you drop it just a little bit differently, is sampling from these two mixture components with two associated means, standard deviations, two, and the height of these so that height right there has something to do with the model probability. So all of this integrates to 1. So it's a probability density function. Um, there's a discrete component, and there's continuous components to everything. So lots of good stuff. What we get to observe is a histogram of the data. Now you need to see a little bit of data to be able to distinguish these two modes. And something should be obvious to you that if I push those two modes closer and closer and closer to each other, it gets harder and harder to distinguish everything. So in your simulation study, you'll be studying that phenomenon. So I'll just point out what you're going to be doing is you're going to be coding up the EM algorithm. And the EM algorithm is actually rather simple for this problem, and I'm going to give you pseudocode for it. There's just a few steps that you run through in implementing this. Now, I've written everything down with a univariate normal distribution because I'm bad at drawing high-dimensional normal distributions. But in higher dimensions, I might have something that looks like this. 1 over, I'll get rid of the 2 pi. So f of x given, I'll say, mu vector sigma. That's the covariance matrix. This is going to be proportional to sigma determinant minus 1 half e to the minus 1 half x minus mu transpose sigma inverse x minus mu. So that's the high dimensional variant of everything. So you can plug those in and instead of looking at a one dimensional case, you can do this in higher dimensions. So I'll just point out, this is p dimensional. That's also p dimensional. The model means they have to be because they're additive with the x's. This is going to be p by p. And there are some constraints on that. It has to be positive definite. It actually has to be a covariance matrix. Um, so you can do this in high heat. That's what I've kind of outlined, I guess, here, that I've written everything out in matrix form. So here's what the algorithm is going to do. There's basically three things that it's going to check on. This is going to be for every component you're going to do this. So I didn't write down for k goes from 1 to cap k right here, but you can plug in cap k. I'll do everything on the board today using a two-dimensional case and doing everything in 1D, and your job is to extend that to higher dimensions. I will walk you through a couple of the derivatives you need to take. You might not know how to take matrix derivatives yet. So I'll walk you through that on Monday. Um, what you do is you figure out, basically, at the last time step, the EM algorithm is an iterative algorithm that ups, updates the probabilities of a data point belonging to a particular subgroup. My CKs, unfortunately, are the Zs. So, in everything that I've written down. So, I wrote down Z in my lecture, and I use C in the homework assignment. So, C means cluster or group or something like that. So just keep in mind that the C's are the Z's, essentially, the groups. So the probability that Xi came from cluster CK is synonymous 
with zi being equal to k. That means exactly the same thing. xi came from root k, and I have a Lincoln variable that I can use to distinguish that. So there's two ways to express that. I can either express it through the x's or the zi's. Um, once you have these model probabilities, and I'm going to drive these for you on Monday, so we probably won't get to the derivation of what these probabilities are, but here's the idea. I've got this, his, this density right here, so at some time point in my iterative algorithm, I have some update for mu1 at time t. So I have a mu2 at time t, and I have associated standard deviations. So these are all going to be at time t, and we're going to be updating these as we go through the algorithm. So if I see an xi over here, I probably think that it came from that component. And I can formalize that. And if I see something that's over here, I probably think it came from the second component. And if I saw something in the middle, I might think that the probability of belonging to that component is close to a half. Now, of course, that has something to do with the standard deviation and what I think the pi's are as well. So obviously, if I have something closer to the means, that's with respect to the standard error. So that's going to define that distance for us. We will use all that stuff and we will define what those probabilities are, but I bet you could probably already come up with a procedure for trying to model those probabilities. We'll do it formally on Monday. I don't think we'll get through everything today. Once you have those probabilities, so for every data point, you can do this. And I can model the probabilities in each component, and those probabilities will all sum up to one as well. So I'll have that constraint. Uh, once I have those probabilities, I can find my mu's. In the mu's, we will derive this one on Monday as well. Um, they look like this. So it's the sum of the um, pi i k's, those model probabilities, times the xi. So typically what we would do, if we knew what the component labels are, we'd just take the straight average, x bar in that group, if we had all the labels. So if I had all the labels, and I knew all of the xi's associated with group 1, then those model probabilities would essentially be 1s and zeros. So I would know exactly where they came from. So these probabilities right here would be ones and zeros. So a collection of ones and zeros, and I'd be dividing by the sum of a bunch of ones. So effectively, this is x bar for the particular groups if my pi's are one or zero for the associated groups. Um, so this is just a weighted average. So it is probably what you can imagine. If I have probabilities of coming from the particular groups, I could just write down these weighted averages. So we're going to replace our x bar with a weighted average, where the weights are defined through these probabilities. And this looks very, very similar to your empirical estimator for covariance. So I wrote it down in high dimensions right here. This is an outer product of everything. So in one dimension, that would be squared. And this would basically look like the x size minus the mu's squared. And then I would normalize it. So your empirical estimator for variance very typically looks something like this. Xi minus mu squared divided by n minus 1. So that's the typical thing. In high dimensions, a square looks like this. Xi minus mu transpose. This is an outer product. That is a matrix. So instead of writing down the, the n minus 1, a lot of people will use n minus k. That's the n minus p, where p is the dimension of everything. That's the typical unbiased estimator. The MLA looks like that. That's actually probably a better estimator. So we'll get to that a little bit later in chapter 7. So this is just a weighted average of the outer product. And it looks very similar to your empirical sort of estimator. So all you're coping up in this is two for loops, essentially. And they're just updating all of these parameters at every step and just swinging through everything. So I update the model probabilities based off of 
what I think my views were last time. Then I update my views and I re uh, update the index on the views. I update the sigma using this formula, and then I plug them right back into here, and I update those model probabilities. So the only thing I haven't written down explicitly are what are these probabilities, and I'll do that on the day. So you'll be coding this thing up, so even though we're gonna do a lot of math to derive this, it's a pretty easy implementation. And so what I want you to do in this simulation study that I'm giving you, and I'll give you a couple weeks time to do this. So I'll post this online after class today. Um, we'll talk about it more, but if you want to get started and start reading through it this weekend, that would be a good idea. Um, basically, it just says that I want you to work out these MLEs. These are the MLEs for everything. I'll tell you which function you need to take derivatives over and set equal to zero, and then solve for things. And we'll go through, I think, probably the pi's and the mu, and I'll leave you the sigmas, and I'll tell you how to take that derivative. So I'll leave you a little bit of work, and then what I want you to do is simulate data out of this mixture model right here, and change kind of the dimensionality of the problem. Push the modes closer to each other and see how well you can identify all the the parameters that you simulated the data from. Let me just ask a question. Does all this look familiar to you? Have you seen this any time lately? I'll give you guys a heads up. Yesterday, this is what Allison was doing. So in the colloquium yesterday, there was a really cool colloquium of doing a mixture over factor analyses. So factor models look like their normal distributions. They're parameterized in an interesting way. Um, and um, she had a mixture over those so that she could do her projection, her dimension reduction, which is a factor analysis, which can be equivalent to PCA in some parameterizations, um, and then also fitting the, the model parameters in there. So this is effectively what Allison was working on. And there's a lot of interesting problems that could be derived out of there. So what she was saying yesterday is, she comes, she has a basic version of this coded up. So, and what she'd like to do is extend that version. So she's looking for students to do that. So one problem she could do is change the dimension of the factor loadings, the dimension of the projection for each cluster. That's a little bit harder to do because you have to jump between different dimensions. So there's a little bit more work to do. That could be a whole thesis in itself. So I think coding that thing up, doing model selection on the dimension of the projection that you're projecting into, which is equivalent to PCA under some factor loading parameterizations. And then, the, of course, the question is, is, what is cap K? How many different groups do you have? What she did last time, yesterday, in colloquium, is she assumed all of the subgroups have the same factor loadings in the same dimensionality. And that probably isn't the case. And it would be interesting to see for certain data sets where that's not the case. Okay. So just some motivation for a practical problem. This could be useful in your thesis, potentially. Okay, so I want you to implement the EM algorithm, change some of the model parameters, show when it works well, and show when it doesn't work well. Okay, so if you make the variance, it's very big compared to the distances between the mu's. It's not gonna work so well. And as you scale up the dimensionality of the problem with a fixed n, it'll start degrading as well. So you need more data points in high dimensions to distinguish the modes. Okay, on Monday, I will run a simulator for this, and we'll experience that, and then I'll ask you to code something up that's just slightly more complicated. Let me remind us what the EM algorithm is and what it's trying to do. So the EM algorithm, where E stands for expectation, and M stands for maximization, solves this problem. I'll write it out just a little bit differently using the argument that maximizes some parameter that we're interested in. So for our problem, the thetas are going to be the mu's. Mu, um, I'll just write down k. I've got a collection of those. 
I also have the sigmas that I want to update in everything. And I also have the pies. It goes from one to capital. So those are my model parameters in this associated um, mixture model. So we want to learn those. So that's the whole thing. I will say this is conditional on data, and I'm going to just drop that from the notation. So the data that we're conditioning on are the x's. So it's the collection of the x1 to xn. So that's all our data. So our, our name of the game is to come up with some sort of maximum likelihood estimator of thetas. Keep in mind, we don't get to see the latent variables, the disease in all of this. So this is going to be defined as the integral, and it's going to be the arg maximizer over theta of this thing right here. And I'll use the, the notation of the book. F theta given psi, and then I'll just remind us that um, we're conditioning everything on the data as well. I'm going to drop that from the notation, so I'm writing that in just really lightly. So everything is always conditional on the data. Every step of everything has the data. You're allowed to look at the xi's. So if you don't look at the xi's in this step, you've made a mistake. So, and I'm going to integrate over this d psi. So I'm going to integrate this thing out. These are the labels. So these are the zi's. z1 to zn. So there's a label associated with each one of the x's. The x's are in here as well. So this is the missing thing. So you don't get to observe this. For our problem, those are the class labels. If we knew what the class labels are, we're doing supervised learning, we can just give estimates using basic NLEs, the associated group averages and associated group estimators for the, the standard deviation. So let me just say a little bit more about this. This whole thing right here, this function, is probably something like a likelihood. Or maybe it's a posterior probability. Maybe it's a Bayesian sort of thing. So I'm averaging over everything. So I'm doing two different steps. I'm averaging over the missingness, which I would say this is a really good principle. Things you don't know you should probably average it. Does anybody know why? What does it do in a statistical sense to average? It doesn't change the expectation of anything. It doesn't change your center, what you expect to see when you average. Jared? I was just going to say marginalized, but I didn't. Yeah, averaging is another word for marginalizing, I guess, in some sense. But what does averaging do? What do they teach you in design? There is a reason we average. So if I wanted to know what was the average um, midterm score for the class, I could come up with an unbiased estimator, select any one of you, and I can look at what your midterm score is and report that as the average. It's not a good estimate. So, why not? Yeah, that's true. You should use all the data. So, it feels good, right? But there's got to be a real reason. Averaging reduces the variance. That's it. So if you want to reduce the variability in your estimator, you average. So averaging reduces variability. So that's a good thing to do. So, so we're going to average over the quantities that we don't know the missing stuff. So in a general setting, the reason I'm writing it down with different parameters here, 
to look just specifically to this problem is you can use this whole process, the EM algorithm, to solve a problem like this in any case where you see missingness. So Allison also yesterday during the colloquium talked about having missing data. That's a real phenomena, so you could use the EM algorithm in a case like that. So you could combine MCMC and the EM algorithm. You could do a full-blown MCMC. There's a lot of ways to tackle that problem. EM is one such way. Uh, so this is the idea, averaging over the missing stuff, condition on your data everywhere, and then maximize those parameters if you want to give something. Now if you're a full-blown Bayesian, you'd probably want to give the full distribution of the thetas and give a posterior distribution, and then I can give some estimator out of that. The only penalty that you'll pay for doing that is computational time. So it'll take a lot longer to solve a problem like that versus solving a problem like this. If you do find that desirable, um, MCMC algorithms are iterative algorithms as well, and you need to initialize them. And very typically what I do in mixture analyses, and I'm doing full-blown MCMC, is I first run the EM algorithm, so I come up with a really good initial value. So, and I can do it quickly. So it runs in a couple seconds, and then I can speed up the MCMC. So, so no matter which camp you live in, I still think that this is a good thing to, to know about. Um, it's also the backbone of variational Bayes. So variational Bayes comes up with a posterior in here, and it factorizes that posterior in a very specific way. Um, comes up with an approximate posterior, and they run EM over the top of it. So if you ever hear anybody talking about variational Bayes, they're doing EM. Okay. So let me write down what the EM algorithm is. And what we're going to do is we're going to prove real quickly that the EM algorithm solves this problem. And then I'm going to show you the specific details for the mixture model, probably on one day. So this is the EM algorithm. So it's an iterative algorithm, so I need to start somewhere, and I'm going to need to initialize this. So I'll say step zero, initialize. My thetas, so theta zero. So I'll start indexing if t is equal to one, and I have an initializer. In any EM, there's two steps. There's the E step, the expectation step, and there's the M step, the maximization step. So the E step is, I'll give it some notation, it's to form this function Q theta, given where we were last time. And that's going to be defined as the expectation of the logarithm of whatever this function is. This joint. I'm going to say likelihood. Now, if you are an R dent Bayesian, you won't like me saying that because I'm integrating over a parameter in the likelihood. I watch people do it all the time. I'll give you a Bayesian interpretation. I'll tell you what people are fighting about when you do that. Um, Fisher used to integrate over likelihoods and people would complain about it saying, what's your justification for doing that? And it's not a random variable and you haven't um, stretched the space right with the Jacobian. So, uh, I'll say more about that next time. If it really bothers you, replace my likelihood comment with posterior distribution and imagine I multiply by one as a prior. So I used a uniform prior. Those would be mathematically equivalent, and if you're a philosopher, you would say they might be mathematically equivalent, but they're totally different. To an engineer, they would say, I don't get it. <laughs> it's the same thing that I code up on the computer. Okay, so there's a way you explain things, and there's what you actually do. I'll give you both explanations next time. So this is going to be the logarithm of f, theta, and sine, my missing stuff. So my model parameters, the missing stuff. And of course, I'm going to condition on the data in here as well. I'll write it in, but I'm going to drop that notation as we run through everything. And this expectation is going to be taken with respect to psi, the missing stuff. So I'm going to be integrating that out. So there's no size in this equation, given where we were last time. So what we're actually doing is we're setting up a fixed point sort of thing 
and we're going to be iterating into convergence on the theta t's. So let me just write out specifically what this expectation is. It's an integral, and you either need to approximate this integral at every step of everything, or you need to analytically write down what this integral is. For the two-component mixture model or a k-component mixture model, you can solve this integral in closed form. And I'll work through that for you um, probably on Monday. I don't think we'll get to it today. But this is going to look like this. Log of my likelihood function. And I'm going to just slowly start dropping this data notation. So it's everything, again, is conditional on the data. So it's a little superfluous to write it down every single time. So given the data, and then I'm going to integrate it with respect to whatever this distribution is. And this is going to be our model for missing this. Um, again, I can assume maybe things are missing at random. Maybe I can put a uniform prior on that. Or maybe I can try to identify the way things are missing. So again, something that we heard about yesterday at Colloquium. So this looks like this. I'm just going to use this same notation, f. But of course, these functions are different. So this is going to be f psi given theta t. And this also is going to be conditional on the data. Everything conditional on the data. d psi. And so that's going to give me a function that is defined in terms of the thetas and the theta t's right here. And so the theta t's at our last step are going to inform our missing this. And then based off of that, we're going to update those model parameters theta. So if you can write this down in closed form, you can pull this outside of the loop and just write it down once and know what the Q function is. So, and that's what you're going to do for your, your homework assignment. Then you're going to maximize this thing. Theta t plus one, our updated parameter, are going to be the arguments that maximize over theta this function q. So I'll just update those. So when I showed you the assignment, I can write down a procedure for doing that maximization over the pi's and over the mu's and the sigma's. So what I'm ultimately doing is I'm just updating my maxima because I have a procedure that I know that gives me the maxima. So you run this thing until convergence, until the thetas converge. How do you check convergence? You basically see that the number doesn't change at every iteration. So it will be constantly changing up to some decimal place so you'll define the precision of your analysis. I will point out, um, for the k-component mixture model, there's lots of local modes all through the space. And so what most people do is they usually use a local optimizer here, and they just run everything over and over and over again and get lots of different answers. Then they plug everything back into the likelihood function and they see which answer is biggest globally. So we can do an engineering trick and use local optimizers to build global optimizers. And one nice thing about that is you can run this in batch with lots of different starting conditions, run it over and over again in parallel. Collect those answers real quickly and compare them to each other. And so we'll go through that next time. OK, so I want to just point out these two steps kind of mimic what's going on here. This arc max is the same. We're just maximizing something. But this Q function, while I'm integrating out psi, doesn't have any size in here. I've done the same thing over here. This function right here is ultimately different from this thing right here. One nice thing about it is it has some old values in there. Theta's in my last step so that I can set up an iterative procedure. And so what we need to show is that converging here is the same thing as solving this maximization problem. And they're not obviously the same. So it's obvious that they look similar. And in fact, they're not identical to each other. So they're slightly different. Let's work through this and show that these maximization problems are ultimately um, different, but they converge to the same answer. OK.
truth. The DM works. So what I mean by works is that this algorithm solves the maximization problem that I just erased on. So I'm just going to write down F sum given theta. I'm going to give this a definition. This is going to be our joint distribution. F sum theta divided by cap F theta. Okay, so I dropped all of my notation on the data. I just am going to remind you this very last time. This is conditional on the data. This is conditional on the data. So I can write that in at every step, and this is conditional on the data. Everything is conditional on the data. So this is a basic application of just basis theorem, or conditional probabilities, whatever you want to, however you want to say it. So this f theta right here is just the integral of this thing. Theta and psi, d psi. So it's just the marginalization. It's what the original problem is solving. So, so I'm just writing down something that we know is true. You've got your joint likelihood divided by the margin, and that gives me a conditional. Just like that. Would be a small cap? I mean a cap F because that's this. This is what I wrote down last time. F theta R max theta is equal to integral F theta given psi d psi R max. So this function right here is cap theta. Why did I change it to cap f theta instead of little f theta? Because I'm entirely inconsistent about which letter I use there. So I just wanted to make it cap f because it's the important function. So no great reason. If you want to make it a little f, that's OK. Keep in mind, they're all different functions. So that little f is not that little f either. They're a different function because they have different arguments. So just the use of the notation. Okay, so I'm going to take a logarithm of both sides of it. This is going to be log of the conditional is equal to log of the joint. And don't worry too much about me always reversing these. It doesn't have any great meaning. I'm just, again, inconsistent. So this will be, let me just cut it back. Psi, theta given psi. Try to have some consistency here. Minus the logarithm of cap F theta. So logs of ratios are differences in the logs. So nothing fancy there. I'm going to resolve for this because this is my objective. I'm trying to maximize this function. Maximizing the logarithm of that function will give me the exact same thing because logarithms are monotone. So, log cap F theta is equal to log of the joint minus log of the conditional. So I'm just rearranging terms. So I just brought this over to the left hand side, and I brought that over to so exactly the same thing. Again, our whole goal is to optimize that. Taking a logarithm doesn't change that. So I'm trying to optimize this, and I can write it down like that. Obviously, these two functions have something to do with each other. So one is the conditional, one is the joint, so one is a slice through the joint. The conditional is a slice through the joint. So they certainly have something to do with each other. Come over here. Again, logarithm of F theta is equal to the log of the joint. I did it again. Minus the log of the conditional.
same thing that we were on last time. Now I'm going to take expectations over both sides. So I do something to the left hand side, I do it to the right hand side, it doesn't change the equality. So expectation, and I'm going to take the same expectation that's defined here, right here. So this is going to be psi given theta t, f theta, log of f theta, is equal to expectation of these two logarithms. The joint minus the conditional. I don't even have to optimize it. 
Because no matter what I do to theta, if I move it away from theta t, if I update it, it's just going to be making this smaller. So, which is ultimately going to be making that bigger. So that's maximizing something. So, um, let me just write this down. Integral of f psi given theta t. So our likelihood function given theta t. Again, this is conditional on data. Everything is conditional on data. You get to observe the x's at every step. I'm going to integrate over this. I'm going to say it a little bit different. I'll say that it's a likelihood that is proportional to a distribution. If I normalized it, I would know what this integrates to. So let me change my lingo just for a minute. Everything is just off by a constant that doesn't change anything in terms of uh, um, maximization. I multiply something by a positive constant, it will preserve where the um, maximization is happening. So I can think of this as a likelihood, or I could normalize it. Again, we're assuming we can integrate over it. So it's integral in the first place. So instead of saying this is a likelihood function for a second, I'm just going to treat it as a distribution. It's off from a distribution by some cause, constant. It needs to be normalized. But let's just assume it's a disk. So what does that integrate to if it is a distribution? One. So what happens if I do this? Zero. So that's a zero. And if I threw some constant in here, I can still get that zero. So multiplying zero by something, no big deal. Okay, so that's zero right there. I'm going to change this just a little bit. This is the same thing as the logarithm of the integral f psi given theta. Oh, let me change this. It'll just make my argument a little bit easier. t plus 1. So same thing, still integrates to 1. So just add a t plus 1 in there. I'm going to divide by f psi given theta t times f psi given theta t. t psi, right here, and I'll close my line. So I haven't changed anything. I just multiply by a funny formula in all of this. Okay. So this thing is going to be bounded by something. So I'm going to say something about this. So I'm going to write down a question mark, and we're going to figure out which sign this is. I know something about this. Logarithm is not only monotonic, but it's also a, is it convex or concave? It's the right word. Concave. concave. Yeah. So this sort of function looks like a cave. So it's a concave function. So I can maybe apply an inequality that I know to all of this and insert this logarithm right here. F psi given theta t plus 1 divided by F psi given theta t times F psi given theta t. So I just move this logarithm just to the term that I'm taking the expectation over. D psi. Why can I do something like this? What is this smack of? Okay, I'll give you a hint. Yeah, this is Jensen's. So it goes that way. I'll let you work out the direction of that, but for concave function, the inequality goes that way, and for convex functions, it goes that way. And if you want to use the term convex up or convex down, those are the terms I, I usually use. I can never really remember. So, so this is Jensen's inequality. So it just says the sum um, concave up or concave down function of the expectation of something is going to be bounded by the expectation of the concave convex function of whatever you're taking the expectation over in the first place. So application of Jensen's inequality. 
Now we're going to write all this thing out just a little bit differently. So this is going to be, and we can leave this. This is going to be integral logarithm of f psi given theta t plus 1 times f psi given theta t d psi minus integral logarithm f psi given theta t this is the thing down in the denominator right here times f psi given this is t as well d psi so I just broke this into two integrals. So I expanded the logarithm. Logarithm over ratio is the difference of the logarithms. Integrals are linear operators, so I can break them up over the subtraction sign. And so that's what we've done. This function is familiar to us. This is the S function. This is S theta t plus 1 given theta t. Let's just remind ourselves of that, what this thing is. These are the two arguments and everything. That is what we wrote down here. So that's this right here. So just write out the definition of this expectation. This function right here, these are S functions here. If you write down explicitly what that expectation is. This one. It's going to be S theta t given theta t. So this is going to be conditional on theta t, and it's also going to be an argument of that exact same thing, where these two arguments are different from each other. This is an updated argument. Remember, I bounded everything here by zero. And so let's just write out our finished result. Write it here. So this is going to say that S of theta t, given theta t, I'm just going to pull this over to the other side of that zero. The bound goes in the same direction. This is S theta t plus 1, given theta t. That's excellent. This means it's a decreasing function. So anywhere I move this argument, if I just make it something different than theta t, it's going to decrease it. So s given theta t is decreasing. What's kind of nice about it is I don't need to optimize any of this. I didn't use any properties of how I got theta t plus 1. I didn't use that that was maximizing the q function. I just said something about any other parameter other than the theta t. So it decreases everything. What that means, since we're subtracting it off, is that we can just focus on optimizing this if we want to optimize that thing. That's what EM does. So next time what I want to do is I want to write down explicitly what the Q function is for the mixture model, and then I want to work through a few steps here, and then I want to implement it for you and show you how things should run. So you'll have something to compare to in your simulation study. I don't tell you on the simulation study which parameters, which sigma, which mu. You will pick those judiciously and show different cases. So you'll have some obvious cases where everything's really far apart from each other, and then you'll have some unobvious cases where the modes are close to each other, and the algorithm should work better in all of those cases. That's what you'll need to do. So more of that on Monday. Do we have homework to do today? Nothing to do. Next week, right? Okay, enjoy the weekend, you guys. Thank you very much.
wrote this down last time. This was the sum of context size that are in group K. Yeah, uh, divided by N K. Yeah, that's all. That's all. And then the pi is that's the pi is equal to. So here's the way it's the problems bar of one plus the So this thing is just going to be. Uh, If there were one from zero to zero, okay. keep in mind this is an I over all of them. So I'm either going to have a vector of one of these ones here. That will sum up to this end. Does that make sense? Yes. So we accomplish all of it. If there's no last one, it's not one from zero to all of them. This is a big problem. We didn't need that much. And we know what the pi is associated with each. Oh, those are the probabilities of each. Okay, okay. If you're Bayesian, 